Now in our 23rd year of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1209 with a release and air date of Saturday, April 30th, 2022. Please take the program to your air following the cue tone Welcome to This Week in Amateur Radio. We are your weekly amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1209 of This Week in Amateur Radio. We have some FCC news this week, including the FCC Universal Licensing System is down once again. We will have all the details. The FCC issues a substantial fine for the sale of illegal drone transmitters. We will tell you all about that. And the commission is seeking public input on improving existing receiver rejection of interfering signals. We will tell you how you can participate. The ARRL begins its new youth licensing grant program and has a scheduled information webinar on the new Foundation Club grant program. A new section manager will be taking office in Colorado. We will introduce you to him. The people of Friedrichshafen, Germany are excited to host the first international amateur radio exposition in Hamfest in two years. The U.S. government is undertaking a new study on HF propagation, but this time from inside of the ionosphere. We will tell you how the new study will work. And... One family is celebrating many generations of amateur radio operators. We will introduce them to you and their love of amateur radio in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll have information from Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will answer the question, are RAM disks still a thing? And should they be used with modern computers? And Leo will also explain public key cryptography. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will explain the art of troubleshooting in the digital world. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives this week Bill continues his mini-series on amateur radio's fallen flags. This week, Bill looks at a little radio company that got its start in New York City, the Hammerland Radio Corporation. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, covers everything you need to know to install and maintain your tower and antenna installation for your station. This week, Greg will talk about the proper climbing belts to use while working on your tower antenna system. And... We will have the latest update from Parks on the Air with Vance Martin, M3VEM. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, and participating as one of the news anchors this week, I am George, W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, on a beautiful sunny spring day, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our amateur radio facility atop the Catskill Mountains of western New York State, where the weekend squires have suddenly appeared to mow their grass. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where it didn't snow this week, but boy was it cold, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where the barometer has been flying up and down almost as much as the thermometer has lately, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here's Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Leading off the news this week, don't look now, but the FCC's universal licensing system is offline again. 
Last week, on the day the FCC's new ham radio license application fees took effect, a system outage halted the agency's electronic batch filing system and files could not be processed. The ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator sent out a notice to League members making them aware of the shutdown that occurred on Tuesday, April 19th. The FCC had asked that no further files be submitted for exam sessions or license applications until the issue could be resolved. The system did come back online a few days later. However, on Wednesday, April 27th, in a notice to all VECs, the FCC again asked them to refrain from submitting any amateur radio exam session or license application files while the Commission works to resolve yet another issue with the Universal Licensing System. As we come to air, the ULS application filing system was not functioning properly, and no new amateur radio call signs and licenses have been issued since Monday, April 18, 2022. Tuesday, April 19th, was the day the new $35 FCC application fees became effective for amateur radio. ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordination Manager Maria Soma, AB1FM, reports that new call signs are not being assigned by the Commission, even if the applicant has paid the FCC application fee. The FCC was processing upgrade applications through the system without an issue because there are no fees required for those applications. In addition to new call signs not being issued, even if the applicant has paid the FCC fee, some applicants are also having issues paying and logging into the system. Other types of license application transactions may also be experiencing problems. Applicants should expect delays with license, call sign, and application processing associated with individuals and amateur radio clubs. Amateur radio license filings are currently on hold until further notice, and FCC did not estimate how long the system would be down. We will keep you updated as information from the FCC becomes available. The United States Federal Communications Commission is claiming that public safety could be imperiled by the operation of unauthorized drone transmitters and is seeking more than $3 million in combined fines from the device's distributor. The agency's complaint, filed in U.S. District Court in Portland, Oregon, charges that at least 65 models of the transmitter were never FCC certified. Certification would have ensured its RF signals did not interfere with the Federal Aviation Administration's aeronautical radar system or any government transitions. The FCC civil complaint against the distributor Hobby King states that at least 15 of the transmitters created a threat to public safety. The FCC also said that the devices do not serve a legitimate amateur radio purpose. According to a report posted on the Oregon Live website, Hobby King has told the commission that it believed no marketing rules exist specifically for this kind of equipment, which is capable of transmitting on amateur and non-amateur frequencies. The FCC countered, however, that its rules forbid radio frequency devices to be sold without first being labeled and authorized consistent with its rules. The agency is asking for $2.8 million from Hobby King for its violations. It is also seeking an additional $39,278 plus interest for Hobby King's failure to respond to earlier orders. Hobby King has stated that a required response from the company would have violated its Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. The United States Federal Communications Commission is asking for public input on ways to achieve RF interference immunity in receivers of radio signal. In a notice of inquiry adopted this month, the Commission has committed itself to explore options for improvement in this area. The Commissioners are seeking comment on such things as recent technical advancements in the design of receivers, better ways to assess and rate receiver performance parameters, and insights into industry standards for these measurements that may have been created by the IEEE, ANSI, 3GPP, and other standardization organizations. Until now, most FCC spectrum management efforts have concentrated on regulations governing transmitter performance. The FCC said in a press release that its goal is to lay the foundation for future actions that could help create more transparent and predictable radio frequency environments for all spectrum users. 
The Commission has expressed its concern most recently with new wireless services being added around the United States, making it all the more critical that service receivers already in place are capable of rejecting signals from outside their intended frequency band. One on such going case involves the Federal Aviation Administration's attempt to prevent 5G wireless transmitting towers from interfering with airplane navigation systems. The Federal Communications Commission has started accepting applications for electronic engineers for recent graduate positions in the Pathways program, which is located in the Office of Engineering and Technology in Washington, D.C. Candidates should be recent graduates for this one-year developmental program, which may lead to a term or permanent appointment. Training will cover the agency's policy and rulemaking processes, technical training for a wide variety of telecommunications services and technologies, and training on engineering and policy principles relevant to the fast-paced telecommunications industry. Additional duties and related training may also include performing propagation analysis of terrestrial, satellite, and or airborne systems, or evaluating the emission characteristics of various transmitters to validate the coexistence with neighboring systems. Online, you can visit USA Jobs for the complete position summary and to apply. A division of the United States Department of Defense is hoping to gain a greater understanding of how HF waves propagate by taking detailed measurements from inside the ionosphere itself. This takes information gathering into a new realm because these studies typically rely on data gathered done from systems on the ground. The U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency is looking to take the measurements using sensors on board very low Earth orbit satellites. The agency project, named Project Ouija, is designed to get a better model of the ionosphere to address the challenges of electromagnetic noise facing HF radio transmissions of warfighters. The satellites are about 200 to 300 kilometers or 125 to 185 miles above the Earth. According to an article on the Industrial Equipment News website, the satellite payload will do direct sampling to measure electron density, but will also conduct indirect measurements using radio occultation. Jeff Rogers, the program's manager in DARPA's Strategic Technology Office, was quoted on the website saying that Ouija's work inside the ionosphere would supplement measurements that would still be taken from the ground. He said the goal was to develop and validate accurate near real-time HF propagation predictions. In the early morning of April the 26th, two explosions occurred near a small village in the Grigoriopol district of the country of Moldova, close to the border with Ukraine. This is the location of a very large shortwave and medium-wave broadcast station. The Grigoriopol site consists of 950 hectares and has 20 high-power transmitters. The first blast took place at 0640 and the second at 0705, and masts appear to have fallen to the ground. Now, the two most powerful transmitters are out of service, one at 1,000 kilowatts and the other at 500 kilowatts. Both were transmitting Russian state-owned radio Vesti FM. The station was built in the late 1960s, but expanded in the 1990s. In 1997, several antennas were destroyed or damaged by excessive icing. This resulted in the loss of a 350-metre-tall guide mast and a 250-metre-tall mast used for medium-wave broadcasting. The arrays include a steerable shortwave radio antenna and several 160-metre-tall medium-wave towers. Antennas of these dimensions, using 1 million watts, are capable of transmitting waves over any distance. The waves can circle the Earth and come back round. The main customers of the transmitting service are the Russian Television and Radio Broadcasting Network and Transworld Radio. Responsibility for the attack was not immediately clear. The ARRL Youth Licensing Grant Program, in effect since April 19, 2022, will cover the one-time $35 application fee for new amateur radio license candidates younger than 18 years old for tests administered under the ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator Program. With more on this exciting new program for prospective young amateurs, we go to League Headquarters where John Ross, 
KD8IDJ files this report. ARRLVEC manager Maria Soma, AB1FM, said, We are thrilled that we are able to provide this opportunity for our youth candidates. The $35 FCC application fee will be reimbursed after the ARRLVEC receives the completed reimbursement form and after the new license has been issued. The reimbursement check will be mailed to the fee payer. Also, candidates younger than 18 years old would pay a reduced exam session fee of just $5 to the ARRLVEC team at the time of the exam. That $5 fee is for all candidates under the age of 18, regardless of the exam level taken, but you must provide proof of the under 18 status at the session. The ARRL board approved the Youth Licensing Grant Program in July of 2021, and you can visit the ARRL website for the program instructions and the reimbursement form at www.arrl.org slash youth hyphen licensing grant program. The ARRL board approved the Youth Licensing Grant Program at its July 2021 meeting in Hartford, Connecticut, expanding on the scope of the original motion proposed by ARRL Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB. The board believes the recruitment and training of young amateur radio operators is a necessary and proper mission of the ARRL and subsidization of the $35 fee will reduce the number of new amateurs that would otherwise be lost from these groups. Initially, the new program would serve up to 1,000 new license applicants under 18 years old. The program length is indefinite. It may be renewed or terminated by the Administration and Finance Committee or by the Board of Directors. Goals of the program include expanding the reservoir of trained operators, technicians, and electronics experts within the amateur radio community and removing a financial obstacle to young people who wish to acquire an amateur radio license as a means of encouraging potential careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The new program initially would serve up to 1,000 new license applicants younger than 18 years old. Visit the ARRL website for the program instructions and reimbursement form at www.arrl.org forward slash youth hyphen licensing hyphen grant hyphen program. ARRL Colorado Section Manager Robert Wareheim, N0ESQ, has resigned from the position effective June 30th, 2022. I appreciate all the hard work that you have put in and wish you the best for the future, responded ARRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY. Wareham has a long history of leadership within ARRL, serving as State Government Liaison, Public Information Coordinator, Section Emergency Coordinator, Division Vice Director, and finally, Section Manager since 2006. Wareham has told Walters he was stepping down because he didn't feel he could devote the time necessary to the Section Manager role for the remainder of his term. On the recommendation of Wareham and Rocky Mountain Division Director Jeff Ryan, K0RM, Walters has asked Amanda Alden, K1DDN, to serve the remainder of Walden's term, which ends September 30th, 2023. Alden has served as an assistant section manager and region emergency coordinator for the South and Southeast all hazard regions of Colorado. The results are in for the 21st USA Championships in Amateur Radio Direction Finding, or ARDF. With more details on the results, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, at League Headquarters. The four days of competitions were held from April 7th through the 10th in Prince William Forest Park in Northern Virginia. And the competition results will help determine the makeup of the ARDF Team USA at the 20th ARDF World Championships, now set for September 2022 in Serbia. 30 contestants completed in categories for men and women ranging from the ages of 15 to 70 plus, and all of those competitive events were held within the park. After a day of practice, the races began on April 7th with the fast-paced sprint event in which two sets of five transmitters operating on two different 80-meter frequencies transmit sequentially in 12-second bursts every minute. U.S. competitors in the 6th International Amateur Radio Union age categories for men 19 to 70 and women 19 to 65 
are under consideration for membership in the U.S. team for the 2022 ARDF Championships. Up to three competitors in each age group and gender category and competitive format may be on a national team. For more information on amateur radio direction finding, visit the ARRL ADF website. 30 participants competed in categories for men and women, ranging in age from 15 to 70 plus. All the competitive events were held with the Prince William Forest Park on maps provided by the Quantico Orienteering Club of Quantico, Virginia. In an innovative approach, the Backwoods Orienteering Club of Raleigh, North Carolina, organized and sponsored the event across state lines on maps provided by the Quantico Orienteering Club of Quantico. They utilized the Raleigh Group's ARDF knowledge and experience in a beautiful new venue. The course was hillier than typical for most events. Nevertheless, none of the finishers exceeded the 60-minute time limit, noted event director Joseph Huberman said, K5JGH. Other events included Foxering. This event followed the next day. Foxering is a timed race in which the individual competitors use a topographic map and a magnetic compass to navigate through diverse wooded terrain while searching for radio transmitters, which are known as foxes. Two-meter classic, this involved locating up to five transmitters on courses of up to 12 kilometers in length. Course lengths and the number of foxes are adjusted for different age and gender categories so that men, women, youth, and seniors can traverse the course designed to be appropriate for their capabilities. 80-meter classic, this is conducted much like the two-meter classic, but without the restrictions and multipath propagation that is often observed at VHF frequencies. United States competitors in the six International Amateur Radio Union categories for men aged 19 to 70 and women aged 19 to 65 are under consideration for membership in the U.S. team for the 2022 ARDF Championships. Up to three competitors in each age and gender category and competition format will be on a national team. Once again, for more information on amateur radio direction finding, visit the ARRL ARDF website. After a two-year break, amateur radio fans will reunite on Lake Constance in Friedrichshafen, Germany, from June 24th through the 26th, 2022, for Ham Radio, the 45th International Amateur Radio Exhibition. Planning for Europe's largest amateur radio exhibition is underway, and this year's theme is Seeing Friends Again. While amateurs were able to stay connected during the COVID-19 pandemic, Deutscher Amateur Radio Club Chairman Christian Entzfellner, DL3MBG, said, This is exactly what we have been missing over the past two years. He further explained, Despite all the difficulties, this demonstrates how valuable and helpful the amateur radio operator community is. It is high time for personal contact again, with due attention to the safety of each individual, of course. Project Manager Petra Rathgerber added, Together with our exhibitors and partners, we are looking forward to a long-awaited get-together with the international amateur radio industry. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio in the United States, will be among the participating International Amateur Radio Union member societies exhibiting at the convention. The contingent representing ARRL to greet international visitors and to network with representatives of other national ham radio societies will include ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, Chief Executive Officer David Minster, NA2AA, Director of Operations Bob Nauman, W5OV, and Director of Public Relations and Innovation Bob Inserbitzen, NQ1R. ARRL will offer DXCC card checking at its stand, a service that's very popular within the international ham radio community. More information on the 2022 ham radio exhibition can be found at www.hamradio-friedrichshafen.com. According to Mike Walters, W8ZY, ARRL Field Services Manager, an informational webinar about the ARRL Foundation Club Grant Program will be held on Wednesday, May 4th, 2022 at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. This webinar will offer an orientation to the program and provide information on how to apply. 
please register in advance for this webinar. After registering, you will receive a confirmation email containing information about joining the webinar. The Orlando Ham Cajun reported attendance at over 19,000 people for its 2022 event held in February. Sponsored by the Orlando Amateur Radio Club, their 75th anniversary event also played host to the 2022 AWRL National Convention. Hamcation is held annually at the 87-acre Lakefront Central Florida Fairgrounds and Expo Park in Orlando, Florida, and is one of the largest annual gatherings of radio amateurs in the United States. Planning is underway for next year's Hamcation, scheduled for February 10th through the 12th, 2023. More information is available at www.hamcation.com. Members of the Military Auxiliary Radio System, or MARS, will conduct an HF skills exercise from Monday night, May 2nd through Saturday, May 7th, 2022, to practice interoperability with the amateur radio community. A 60-meter high-power broadcast will begin on May 3rd at 0200 UTC, followed by the FEMA Region Net. That will continue four more nights at 0200 UTC with the Region Net. At 1,200 local each day, May 3rd through May 7th, in Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific time zones, the net will be called by region. Mars members will be reaching out to the amateur radio community via the 60-meter Channel 1 net on 5330.5 kHz. These are directed nets. The nets will be run by region. These are not typical everyone check into the net operations. Amateur operators who participate should listen first. Net Control will ask for stations meeting specific criteria to check in, for example, stations in a particular geographic area. Only stations that meet the criteria stated by Net Control should check in to the net. In addition to 60 meters, Mars stations will also reach out on amateur frequencies such as 80 meter traffic nets and other bands they may be able to reach. Ham radio and government radio operators will be sharing messages and testing their operating efficiency starting at 1300 UTC on May 14th in an exercise hosted by the United States Army Military Auxiliary Radio System, or MARS. They'll be taking part in the Armed Forces Day Crossband Exercise, an interoperability event with a history that goes back more than 50 years. Hams will be listening for stations on U.S. military frequencies and transmitting on nearby amateur frequencies. Participating hams will be able to confirm their contact with a QSL card. Hams copying messages from U.S. Army and U.S. Navy stations can request a QSL card online at www.usarmymars.org slash events. Hams seeking a QSL card from U.S. Air Force stations whose messages they have copied should send a request by mail to the Armed Forces Day Celebration Chief, Air Force Mars, 203 West Losey Street, Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, 62225. According to the Department of Defense website, the numerous military stations transmitting messages will include Travis Air Force Base in California, the Newport Naval Radio Station Museum in Newport, Rhode Island, the U.S. Coast Guard Base in Alameda, California, the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and the Barrow Army Reserve Center in Kentucky. Although Armed Forces Day is May 21st, the test is being run a week earlier to accommodate the Dayton Hamvention. Hey, remember RAM discs? Are they still worth setting up? Next. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. A RAM disk is using a portion of your computer memory, you know, the 8 gigs or 16 gigs, or if you're lucky, 32 gigs, as a hard drive, as a disk. The idea being they're so fast to access that if you put something on there, it'd be really quick. And this was a technique very popular a few years ago. In fact, I remember going in to a computer store, this must have been 20 or 30 years ago, and hearing the tech say, explain to somebody, you know, what you really want is eight megabytes, megabytes of RAM in your computer. You want two megabytes for the operating system and programs, two megabytes for a RAM disk, two megabytes for a cache, and I can't remember what he thought the other two were for, but that's a long time ago, and I think it's probably the case that RAM disks these days 
are not worth the time and the effort. Let me let me explain why. Now these days we have a lot of har of uh, storage, a lot of RAM on our computers, pretty much eight megabytes. Goodness, we have eight gigabytes, and that's a starter. Uh, more typically, your computer will probably have 16 gigabytes or more. And it's not unreasonable to say, well, why don't I just take two gigabytes of that and make it a RAM disk? Now, first of all, you're going to need some third-party software. And yes, they still sell it. Uh, you know, $30, $40. You can get a program that will turn that extra memory into a hard drive. But then you're going to have to have the operating system use it as a hard drive. It won't be your C drive or your D drive. It'll be, you know, some other letter. You can assign letters in most of these programs. And uh, you can even have it, remember, it'll when you shut down the computer, it'll go away. So you can even have it automatically load on startup. I'm looking at a program called Data RAM, RAM Disk. Data RAM will load it on startup. It'll save the disk image. It shut down, which is nice because remember, one problem with a RAM disk is RAM goes away when your computer's turned off. So any change you make to it won't normally be saved, but modern RAM disk software will save it. In fact, you can even have it save every few minutes if you plan to put anything on it. Typically, you wouldn't. Typically, you'd use RAM disks for something that's not going to change, something like a program that you load all the time. Here's why it's probably not a good idea. First of all, modern operating systems are really good at using memory to do exactly this. They'll load as much as they can into memory, and if you give them all the memory you've got available, they'll be smart enough to load that that whole program into memory and run out of memory the whole time. There's no reason for you to manually say, well, okay, I'm going to give you 12 gigs, but I'm going to keep four gigs to myself and put the program there. It just isn't efficient, and you're not going to do as good a job as the operating system will. It knows a lot better what it needs. It's also a pain. It's expensive to get. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And the final reason it doesn't make a lot of sense is most computers these days have very fast disks. Solid state drives aren't as fast as RAM, but in most cases they're fast enough that there's no real benefit to loading stuff out of RAM. So let the computer manage memory. It's going to do a better job. Get an SSD if you don't have one. That's what I would spend some money on. If you have an old slow spinning drive, get a solid state drive. That'll make the biggest difference and be the best bang for your buck. Given the trouble, the effort, and the cost of setting up a RAM disk, you're not going to see a whole lot of benefit. There are enterprise level products that are very, very fast disk drives that are essentially just RAM memory backed up by uh, by power. They're very expensive, tens of thousands of dollars. And I honestly don't think those are worth it either. So your system these days, modern operating systems do a really good job of managing memory, processor, let them do their job. And you just enjoy the computing. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? One of the questions I get all the time is, well, what is public key cryptography? I'm going to attempt in the next five minutes to explain it in a way that's easy and understandable. But to start, we have to talk about the early days of cryptography. What is cryptography? It's a secret message. You probably did it as a kid. You write something down and you scramble it up. And then you send it to a friend and only your friend can read it. That's called symmetric key cryptography. The earliest way of doing this was something, uh, it's, I'll tell you how old it is. It's called a Caesar cipher because it was used by Julius Caesar. Uh, it's an alphabetic cipher. The alphabet, A through Z. You assign each letter a number, 1 through 26, and then you scramble it up. What you're doing is a transposition cryptography or transposition cipher is actually a better name for it. What you get is a scrambled up message and you can easily then take a transposition cipher, write it down and transpose it. There's two problems with this. The first problem is it's easy to decrypt. You don't even need a computer to do this. In fact, it's so easy that many newspapers for years, they might even still, I don't know, does anybody get a newspaper, have crypto challenges in the newspaper where they give you an encrypted message and they say, see if you can figure it out. I used to love to do these as a kid. It's a very simple process. You do it by letter frequency. It turns out the English language, the most used letter is, you probably know this, right? E and then T and then A. In fact, I remember the entire sequence by the name Etienne Schurdlou, E-T-A-I-E-T-A-O-I-N-S-H-R-D-L-U. Those are the most used letters 
in order. Typically, what you'll do is go through a cipher. If there's enough text, you can say, well, the most commonly used letter here is Q. That must be E. And then you can go backwards from that. It doesn't take too much to figure it out, especially if in the cipher they've separated words because two-letter words and three-letter words, it's pretty easy to figure out what those are. They occur very often. Things like an, at, and the. It's not hard to figure these out. So that's problem number one. It doesn't take a genius to decrypt a uh, cipher like that. Problem, and by the way, with computers, you could brute force it. You could do it in milliseconds, very fast. Problem number two is it's what we call a symmetric key cipher. You use the same key to decrypt it as you use to encrypt it. And the problem lies in that you need to transmit not only the message, Julius Caesar would send one courier with the encrypted message, but you also have to transmit the key. Otherwise, your recipient won't know what to do with it. So he'd send a separate courier with the key. Now, if both couriers are captured by the enemy, it's all over. It's easily decrypted. So you can see two big flaws with this kind of cipher. And that's because it's a symmetric key cipher. More modern ciphers are what we call public key ciphers. There's two keys. Public key crypto is a very clever mathematical strategy to generate two different keys. Each is a prime number. Each is a factor of one large number. You don't need to know how they create these keys. It's just math. But the point of the generation is it's a one-way process. You can't go in the other direction very easily. Someday, maybe computers will be fast enough to brute force public key crypto. But if your key is long enough, 128 bits or even better, 256 bits, it's going to take a massive computer, many millions of years to decrypt it. So we're not going to worry about that side of it. But this solves the problem of symmetric key crypto because there's two keys. I can publish and give you a public key. Everybody can have it because the public key is a one-way key. All it does is encrypt. It doesn't decrypt. Does that make sense? It turns a message into gobbledygook, but it can't read the key. So in order for me, if you want to send me a message, all I need to do is publish, as I have, my public key. You can use software to use that public key, scramble up a message, and send it to me. You can't even read that message because it's a one-way transition. That message now can only be read by somebody who holds the private key. And that's the most important part of public key crypto is that private key you need to keep safe. You need to put it somewhere no one can get it. And you even keep it more safe usually by adding a passphrase or a long password to it. So even if they were to get it, they'd still have to figure out what it is by using the passphrase. So this is a huge step forward because instead of having to send a courier, two couriers, one with the message and one with the decryption key, I can send one courier and I shout it out to the world. Here's my public key. You can send me a message. All you have to do is encrypt it with this public key because the public key can't be used to decrypt, only encrypt. It can't be used to decrypt, only encrypt. So I have published my public key. When you use public key crypto, you publish your public key and you keep your private key safe. And if somebody sends you a message, which they've encrypted using your freely available public key, you use your private key to decrypt it and then you can read it. This is a clever strategy. First figured out uh, not so long ago, about 50 years ago, and now used everywhere. If you use Signal, the encryption messenger, that uses public key crypto. If you use PGP or G GPG to encrypt messages, that uses public key crypto. When you surf the web and you use HTTPS, TLS, that's public key crypto. And in fact, effectively, almost all the cryptography used these days is public key. Certainly the cryptography used to send messages is public key because it works so well and it's so hard to break. I think that makes sense. I hope I helped you. I didn't even bring in Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice because most of the time when they explain this, they do. They bring in these people. And I've seen <laughs> Cloud, Cloudflare has a very complicated explanation of public key crypto that involves a chest with a lock that only goes one way and not the other. And I don't think it's that complicated. Just remember this. You're going to generate a key pair. When you first set this up, there's the public key you give the world, the private key you keep to yourself. And now you can be sent messages. Similarly, if you want to send an encrypted message to somebody, 
All you have to do is say, what's your public key? In fact, usually you don't even have to ask them directly. Most people who've set up a public key have published it on the key servers. There's key servers all over the world. You type in their email address, it'll say, oh, here's their public key, and you can send them an encrypted message. In fact, why don't you try it? Download GPG Tools uh, and, and search for Leo at leoville.com. That's my public key, and you can send me an encrypted message. If you do it right, I'll send your response back. And for extra points, attach your public key to that message. I'll even encrypt my message back to you. So that's public key crypto. Not too complicated. I hope you understand. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. In 1932, the United States was trapped in the Great Depression. The gross national product had fallen by 50%, and unemployment was 25%. Despite the bleak economic forecast, or maybe because of it, amateur radio was flourishing, with a 300% increase in the number of hams over a five-year period. It was during this time frame that two of the best-known names in amateur radio receivers, Hallicrafters and Hammerland, came into existence. In our last installment, we charted the rise and fall of Hallicrafters. Today, let's look at Hammerland. Oscar Hammerland founded the company that bears his name in 1932. His goal was to produce top-of-the-line receivers for amateur, military, and commercial use. By all accounts, he was successful. The first model was the Comet Super Pro. By the late 1930s, Hammerland introduced the HQ-120X. This was a 12-tube, six-band, single-conversion receiver that covered 540 kilocycles to 31 megacycles. The price in 1938 was $129. With inflation, that's about $900 today. In 1939, the company created the Super Pro model SP200, considered by many to be Hammerlin's finest pre-war receiver. Hammerlin's motto was, Use the set the experts use. The SP200 featured 16 tubes in the receiver, two tubes in the separate power supply, and sold for $279, or about $2,000 today. During World War II, the military, the U.S. Signal Corps, and many governmental agencies extensively used the SP200. After the war, Hammerlin introduced the HQ-129X, which was an updated and improved version of the HQ-120X. Incidentally, the X indicated that the receiver had a crystal filter. Other post-war single conversion receivers included the HQ-140 and the HQ-150. In the Super Pro series, Hammerlin's first post-war model was the SP-210, but it was the SP-600 introduced in 1950 that got everyone's attention. This was a large, solid, and expensive receiver. It contained 20 vacuum tubes, covered 540 kilocycles to 54 megacycles in six bands, weighed 100 pounds, and consumed 180 watts of power. The price in 1950 was $985, almost $5,000 today. A very low frequency version, the SP600 VLF, sold for more than $2,000 in 1950, $300 more than a new Studebaker. The SP600 series was produced in a variety of models until 1972 and was used extensively by the military, the FBI, the CIA, and other government and commercial organizations. The SP600 was not designed with amateur radio in mind. That, along with a price equal to the annual net income of a typical ham, kept it from being a popular amateur receiver. Although the bulk of Hammerlin's output was general coverage receivers, they also produced ham band only units, such as the HQ-110, a 12-tube unit made from 1957 to 1961, and the HQ-170, a 16-tube receiver produced from 1958 to 1968. 
The HQ-170 covered 160 through 6 meters and was triple conversion with IFs of 3035, 455, and 60 kilocycles. Hammerlin's last major receiver was the HQ-180, introduced in 1959. This was a very popular general coverage receiver covering 540 kilocycles to 30 megacycles. It had 17 tubes, a triple conversion design, and sold for $439 in 1959. During the 1950s and 1960s, Hammerlin went through some changes. They moved to Mars Hill, North Carolina, and tried to expand their product line beyond just receivers. They came out with some transmitters, called the HX series, and even ventured into the CB radio market with the CB23, HQ105TR, and the HQ205. The last two units were unique in the CB radio arena, as they had a built-in shortwave receiver in addition to the CB transmitter. Unfortunately, the HX series and the CB radios were not successful and, by 1969, they disappeared. By the late 1960s, Hammerland was in trouble. Their main product was the HQ-180 and its various military and commercial derivatives. Except for the HQ-215, an all-solid-state receiver, the company ignored transistors. Hams no longer looked for tube-type receivers. They wanted transceivers and, by the early 1970s, solid-state 2-meter FM rigs. Even in the shrinking receiver-only market, Hammerlin faced stiff competition from Heathkit, Helicrafters, Lafayette, National, Nightkit, and Allied Radio Shack, all of whom had four or five tube shortwave radios for less than $70. The cheapest receiver Hammerland ever sold had eight tubes and cost twice as much. During the early 1970s, Hammerland tried one last PR blitz with friendly, folksy ads and QST, but it was hopeless. Why should the 1972 amateur spend $400 or more for a receiver when $350 bought a Tempo One transceiver? The writing was on the wall. Even National and Halicrafters, with wider product lines, were on their last legs. And so, in 1972, Hammerlin pulled the plug on the HQ-180 and the SP-600 and closed up shop. The corporate assets, including the name and trademarks, were purchased by the Cardwell Capacitor Company, who also purchased the remains of National at a bankruptcy auction. But even though the company is gone, the indestructible receivers still live on. Today, thousands of enthusiasts rediscover the romance and excitement of shortwave listening with the warm, comforting glow of a Hammerlin receiver. In this day and age of scanners and other pre-programmed receivers, have we lost the art of trolling the HF frequencies for that rare and unique catch? Perhaps we need more Hammerlin receivers in the hands of amateurs. Astronaut Kayla Barron, KI5LAL, has completed a successful scheduled ham radio contact on April 21st with students from the Bellefontaine High School in Bellefontaine, Ohio, via amateur radio on the International Space Station. The radio contact was streamed on YouTube. The students were supported by members of the Champaign Logan Amateur Radio Club, W8FTV, an ARRL affiliated radio club. The school's STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math curriculum, supports the newly formed Bellefontaine High School Amateur Radio Club, W8BCS. Barron is currently serving as mission specialist of the NASA SpaceX Crew-3 mission to the space station, which launched on November 10th of 2021. ARRL, an ARISS supporter, has information for schools and student groups interested in hosting a future amateur radio contact with a crew member on board the ISS. Foundations of Amateur Radio The lure of digital modes and the opportunities they bring are enough to tempt some amateurs to begin a journey into integrating their radio and computer to make a new world come to life. This isn't without pain or challenge, but the outcomes are so enticing that many embark on this adventure every day. 
As a person who has made this trip, it's heartwarming to see the joy writ large on the face of an amateur who makes their first FT8 contact on a homebrew wire dipole rigged together on a Sunday afternoon to take advantage of the latest opening on the 10 meter band. On the flip side, it's heartbreaking to see an amateur falter at the first hurdle, attempting to make their computer talk to their radio and giving up, because it just won't work. At first, this attitude bewildered me in a community of experimenters, but over time I've come to understand that sometimes an analog approach isn't suited to the digital world. There isn't really a place where you can attach your multimeter and see why the serial connection isn't working, nor is there any universal document that can walk you through how to set things up. So for you, if you're in a place where you've all but given up, let me see if I can find words to encourage you to keep trying. I'll skip the propaganda about going digital and move straight to making it work. This might come as a surprise, but in the digital world, things are built in complex layers of interdependence. Said in another way, using an analogy, to turn on a light, you need to flick a switch, which depends on power to the switch, which depends on power from the fuse box, which depends on power from the street, which depends on power from the substation, and so on. If you flick the switch and the light stays off, you need to figure out which part of the chain failed. Did it fail at the bulb or at the substation? If the street is dark, do you need to check the fuse box or the bulb? That's not to say that either or even both can also be faulty, but there's no point in checking until the street has power. From a fault finding perspective, the number of variables that you have control over in the case of a light bulb not switching on is strictly limited. You can control the bulb and the fuse, and in most cases that's about it. The rest of the chain is outside your direct control. In attempting to make a computer talk to a radio, you can be forgiven in thinking that the level of complexity associated with such a trivial task is just as direct and straightforward. Unfortunately, you'd be wrong. It's not your fault. A popular slogan, plug and play, made people think that computers were easy to use and control. The truth is a far darker reality. One of the hidden sources of frustration in the digital world is the extreme level of complexity. In our quest to standardize and simplify, we have built a fragile Jenga tower of software that can collapse at any point. Most of the time, this is completely invisible, but that doesn't cause it to be any less real. Computers are simple, but only if you control the environment. And when I say control, I mean take ownership of each change. Updating the operating system, installing a new application, adding a new peripheral, changing location, all these things, innocuous as they might seem, can fundamentally alter the behavior of your environment. As an example, consider the location of your device. Let's say that you change the location of your computer, either physically or via preference. All of a sudden, your Wi-Fi network stops working, the one that you used for years. Turns out that changing location changed the Wi-Fi driver to stop using a particular channel, not permitted in your new location. If you're curious, this happened to me last week. The point being that troubleshooting is about controlling change in that fragile environment. So when you're trying to figure out how to make your serial connection work, you need to stop fiddling with everything all at once and change one thing at a time. Discovering the layers of dependency makes this difficult at times, but not impossible. For example, a working serial connection requires that both ends are physically connected, speaking the same language at the same speed. That depends on the radio being correctly configured, but it also depends on the computer having the right drivers installed. It also depends on the software you're using being configured correctly to talk to the right serial device and the operating system giving your software permission to do so. It depends on the software using the right radio mode and it depends on the radio being switched on. Now imagine the serial connection not working. Do you check the radio mode before you check if the radio is turned on? What about the physical connection? When you're troubleshooting, you cannot just look at the error message on the screen and follow that path. You need to ensure that all the underlying things are working first. You don't check the bulb until there's light in the street. Same thing. No need to worry about the error until you've discovered that the radio is on, the cable connected correctly, the driver installed correctly, the speed set right, and the mode configured properly. If, and only if, that's all correct, then look at the error. This becomes harder if it worked yesterday. What changed between then and now? Did your operating system do an update? Did your radio forget its settings? Did the cat jump on your desk and dislodge your cable overnight? Is there an earth fault that caused the serial connection to cease working? Sometimes, despite your best efforts, you cannot find the problem. 
At that point, you need to take a step back and think about how to prove that something is working in the way that you think it is. Multimeter to a light bulb to check continuity style. In the case of a serial connection, what can you use to test the link if your favorite tool doesn't work or stop working suddenly? I've said this before, but it bears repeating, since it's not obvious. Troubleshooting is all about discovering and controlling change. Pick one thing to test, prove that it's correct, then pick the next. Eventually, you'll come across a duh moment. Don't sweat it. We've all been there. Now do it again. What's your best troubleshooting moment? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike from Parks on the Air with your month ending March 2022 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. In Parks on the Air news, we hope you'll join us in just a few days for the Spring Support Your Parks event on April 16th and 17th UTC. If the past is any indication, there could be anywhere from six to 800 operators putting parks on the air for the weekend event. This is a great opportunity to get out portable and activate some parks as the weather turns warm, or to just stay at home and have plenty of parks to chase. It's also an excellent opportunity to practice and prepare for the summer's big event, our annual plaque event. This year that happens on July 16th and 17th UTC. All of our plaques, including the three new DX Activator plaques, are now fully sponsored thanks to a number of generous hams. More information about the summer event will be coming over the next couple of months, so stay tuned to these monthly POTA updates and the plaque event section of POTA.app. And now for our monthly stats update. March's warming weather brought out quite a few more operators than the prior month. We had approximately 1,700 operators out as compared to February's approximately 1,500. These 1,700 hams did more than 9,000 activations from over 3,600 parks in 31 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were N2 NWK, who did 289 activations, and W6ZD, who activated 100 different parks. The top hunter for the month was someone that anyone who has ever picked up a QST magazine should recognize, none other than K1RO, who earned the honor by hunting 1,745 parks while making 2,372 QSOs. In Pota DX, we continue to see some very interesting shakeups. By region, the busiest countries are the familiar three of England in Region 1, Canada in Region 2, and Japan in Region 3. Japan once again managed to just squeeze ahead of Canada as the top DX entity with 322 activations compared to Canada's 308. We had a new upset in the top DX activations category this month, with the most activations going to a station in Region 1, M0OVG, who did 52 different activations. The most DX parks activated went to a now familiar call sign, JF7RJM, who finished out just slightly ahead of VA7DBJ with 25 parks activated. Last but not least, let's check in on the progress of the Bailey Sprott Challenge. In 2021, N5HA and W9AV each managed to hunt a park every day, so in 2022 we're following along to see if anyone else can match their feet. At 94 days into the year, we have five activators who have activated every day of the year, N2NWK, KE8PZN, KD4MZM, KB3WAV, and WC1N. The pool of hunters has now dipped to just 40, including yours truly, still in the mix. To all of the Bailey Sprout participants, congrats on your success so far, and we look forward to seeing how you do as we head past the 100-day mark. This concludes our March 2022 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. Some Amstat news this uh, week. If you're going to the Dayton Hamvention, you'll find Amstat in Building 1 with eight adjoining booths this year. You can see demonstrations of the CubeSat simulator, SAT Pac-32. You can ask questions of the Amsat engineering staff, see the Amsat Youth Initiative, that's KidSat, and meet some of the Amsat board of directors and senior officers. There will also be live demonstrations of an Oscar ground station working the satellites. There are many hams that love to get out on the road and provide grids on the satellites, and coming soon will be Ian, K5ZM in Hawaii. He'll be from May 16th through the 26th. And Tyler, WL7T. He'll be traveling to the EL84 from June 24th through June 27th. Both grids are very rare to have someone work from them. AMSAT uh, will have more grid roves in July and August. 
The Dayton Hamvention is four weeks away. It's time to be creating your shopping list and making your travel plans. AMSAT's presence will be felt with eight adjoining booths in Building 1. Highlighting the exhibit will be CubeSat Simulation Hardware and Software Demonstrations, SAT PC Software Demonstrations, AMSAT Engineering Staff Questions and Answer Table, Youth Initiative KidSat Introduction, Oscar Ground Station for Live Satellite Operations, Annual Membership Sign Up and Renewals, AMSAT President's Club Recognition, AMSAT Board of Directors and Senior Officers Meet and Greet, Store Offering AMSAT Merchandise, Books and Aero Antennas. In past years, we had 30 people assist with the AMSAT booth at Dayton. We've had a good response so far to our call for volunteers, but we could really use another 10 to 15 people. The 2022 Hamvention is May 20th through the 22nd in Xenia, Ohio. Would you consider helping AMSAT at the Hamvention this year? The interaction with AMSAT members, satellite operators, designers, and builders makes the whole experience a lot of fun. Meet or renew acquaintances, exchange operating tips, and find out what antennas, software, and equipment other AMSAT members use. We currently expect the AMSAT senior officers and board members to be there too. If you're an experienced operator, great. We can use you and your experience. If you've never operated a satellite before but want to learn more, that's okay. We can use your help too. Whether you're available for only a couple of hours or you could spend the entire weekend with us, your help would be greatly appreciated. Please send an email to phil, w1eme at ampsat.org, if you can help. The AMSAT Tapper Banquet will honor the life of Bob Beringa, WB4APR. The 13th Annual AMSAT and Tapper Banquet will be held at the Kohler Presidential Banquet Center on Friday, May 20th at 1830 Eastern Daylight Time. This dinner is always a highlight of the AMSAT and Tucson Amateur Packet Radio activities during the Dayton Hamvention. This year's banquet will honor the life and accomplishments of longtime amateur satellite and amateur packet pioneer Bob Berninga, WB4APR, who passed away in February. The Kohler Presidential Banquet Center is located at 4548 Presidential Way, Kettering, Ohio. That's about 20 minutes away from the Greene County Fairgrounds. Tickets may be purchased from the AMSAT store. The banquet ticket purchase deadline is Friday, May 13th. Banquet tickets must be purchased in advance and will not be sold at the AMSAT booth. There will be no tickets to pick up at the AMSAT booth. Tickets purchased online will be maintained on a list with check-in at the door at the banquet center. Seating is limited to the number of meals reserved with the Kohler caterers based on the number of tickets sold by the deadline. Register today at the AMSAT.org webpage. Thanks to Phil Smith, W1EME, AMSAT Hamvention exhibit organizer for the preceding information. It's time for the Propagation Forecast Report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports that on April 28, 2022, the Australian Space Forecast Center issued a geomagnetic disturbance warning stating the Earth is currently under the influence of a moderately elevated solar wind speed associated with a southern coronal hole. Late on April 29th, solar wind conditions were expected to enhance further due to the possible arrival of the April 27th coronal mass ejections. G0 through G1 conditions are likely for the next three days with a chance of G2 on April 29th due to both coronal hole effects and impending impact of the CMEs. Aurora may be visible from Tasmania, southern coastline Victoria, and southwestern Australia. On Wednesday, sunspot groups threaded across the sun from southeast to northwest. Daily sunspot numbers peaked at 126 on Tuesday, and the average daily sunspot number for the week was 109.3, up from 64.4 last week. The daily solar flux peaked at 164.4 on Thursday, April 21st, and the average for the week was 156, which was up from 133.9 in the previous week. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux is 125 on April 29th, 110 on April 30th through May 1st, 105 on May 2nd through the 5th, 130 on May 6th and 7th, 128 on May 8th, and 130 on May 9th and 10th. Looking at the planetary A and dice now, it will be 18, 10, and 8 on April 29th through May 1st, 5 on May 2nd through the 5th, 8, 15, 12, and 8 on May 6th through the 9th, respectively, 
and five on May 10th through the 12th. Hams responded quickly in Bosnia-Herzegovina following a deadly earthquake with a magnitude of 5.7 that struck late on Friday, April 22nd. With more details on Amateur Radio's response to the earthquakes, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report from the UK through the Southgate News Service. IARU Region 1 Emergency Communications Coordinator Greg Mossop, Golf Zero Delta Uniform Bravo, reports on the amateur radio response to an earthquake that struck Bosnia and Herzegovina on April the 22nd. At 21.07 UTC on that day, an earthquake registering 5.7 on the Richter scale struck around 45 kilometres southwest of the city of Mostar, but was felt across a wider area, including Croatia, Serbia and Montenegro. Sadly, the quake is reported to have caused one death and many injuries. Five minutes after the earthquake, the Emergency Communications Service of the Association of Radio Amateurs of Bosnia and Herzegovina was activated. Following their plans, three teams from local radio clubs were mobilised and established a network using existing VHF repeaters and a portable crossband unit. A digital connection was also established between Sarajevo and Zenica, Echo 70 Alpha Romeo Alpha, via Winlink, with situation reports being passed in IARU message format. Because of the risk of aftershocks damaging buildings weakened by the first earthquake, the emergency networks are remaining active until the danger has passed. Along with a number of frequencies and repeaters at VHF and UHF, the following HF frequencies will also be in use. 3.612 MHz lower sideband voice and upper sideband digital. 7.125 MHz lower sideband voice and upper sideband digital. This information comes from Allen, Echo 71 Alpha Romeo, the Emergency Communications Coordinator of the Bosnia and Herzegovina Association. Also, ongoing reports on the situation are still being sent via Windlink using the IARU message format. The emergency networks are still in place until the danger from aftershocks has passed. In the UK, the search is on for a replacement to fill the vacancy this summer when Radcom Magazine editor Elaine Richards G4 LFM retires. With more details, we go to Steve Richards, G4 HPE, who files this report courtesy of the Southgate Vibes News Service. The Radio Society of Great Britain is recruiting a Radcom technical editor. Reporting to the managing editor, the successful candidate will commission articles and liaise with authors on their articles, work closely with the expert volunteers on the RSGB technical forum, sub-edit copy sent in by contributors and regular columnists, help to guide the content of Radcom Basics and Radcom Plus supplements with their editors, be part of the team that puts together GB2RS, answer member queries on technical and licensing matters, and help develop the entire coordinated Radcom portfolio, including exploiting new media opportunities. Candidates must be positive, enthusiastic about technology, and have an excellent command of English, a good eye for detail, and be able to work to exacting standards often under pressure. A wide range of radio and electronics knowledge is required, including amateur radio. This staff position is based at RSGB headquarters near Bedford, although an element of working from home could be discussed. The salary is negotiable, depending upon relevant qualifications and experience. For more detailed information about the role and how to apply, see the careers page on the RSGB website, www.rsgb.org forward slash careers. The monthly magazine is published by the Radio Society of Great Britain. Additional responsibilities include putting together the weekly GB2RS news and overseeing production of the Radcom Basics and Radcom Plus Specialist online-only publications. Candidates should have experience in both print and digital formats. Applicants can apply on the Redwood website, which is Redwood Recruitment, that's one word, dot com. The Society is also seeking a technical editor following the recent passing of Gills Reed, G1MFG. For details, visit the Society webpage at rsgb.org stroke careers.
On the east coast of England, radio hams at Caister Lifeboat Station in Norfolk managed to contact 162 other radio amateurs in 25 different countries on Saturday the 23rd of April 2022, when they took part in the annual International Marconi Day event to mark the inventor's birthday. Using the call Golf Bravo Zero Charlie Mike Sierra and a mixture of Morse code, voice and data, Contacts were made with other radio amateurs across the UK, Europe, the USA, Canada and Australia. Notable contacts were made with other International Marconi Day stations in New Haven, East Sussex and Chelmsford, the home of Marconi's original factory. Other long-distance contacts were made with Ian, Victor Kilo 3 Mike Oscar, near Melbourne in Victoria, Australia, and John, Victor Kilo 6 Whiskey Charlie, in Chidlow, Western Australia. The Norfolk Amateur Radio Club ran the all-day special event station at Caister Lifeboat to commemorate the village's original Marconi wireless station, which was established at Caister in 1900. The station was in a house in the High Street known as Pretoria Villa, and its original purpose was to communicate with ships in the North Sea as well as the Cross Sand Lightship. On the Saturday, the closest to Guillermo Marconi's birthday, stations around the world were set up at sites with historical links to the inventor's work. These include Poldhu in England, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, Villa Griffone, Bologna, Italy, and many others. Norfolk Amateur Radio Club Public Relations Officer Steve Nichols, who organised the event, said that the high winds on the dunes at Caister made it difficult to erect their antennas, and they bent alarmingly, but they stayed up all day. Conditions were better in the morning, as there was an ionospheric disturbance in the afternoon, which made communication difficult. In all, Steve said it was nice to get back to Caister after two years of not being able to operate there due to Covid restrictions. Steve commented that they made contacts with other radio enthusiasts all over Europe and as far as Asiatic Russia using speech, Morse code and the highly efficient FT8 digital mode that Marconi could only have dreamed of. They never used more than 200 watts power and often just 100 watts, about the same as an incandescent light bulb. The team wished to thank Case to Lifeboat for again letting them set up the station. The equipment used was a Kenwood TS480 on 20 metres and an ICOM IC7300 on 40 metres. Antennas were a Whiskey 5 Golf India dipole on 40 metres and a G0KYA designed monoband N-fed halfway vertical for the higher HF bands. The Norfolk Amateur Radio Club has more than 100 members, a strong history dating back to the 1950s and has a very active calendar of talks, events, special event stations and courses. It meets virtually online at 7.30pm on Wednesdays with occasional in-person meetings at the Sixth Form Common Room, City of Norwich School, Eton Road, Norwich, Norfolk, November Romeo 4, 6 Papa Papa, with formal proceedings starting at 7.35pm. The programme alternates weekly between talks or club challenges and informal meetings with Morse tuition, electronic construction and Bright Sparks events for youngsters. For more details, see www.norfolkamateurradio.org. The case to Lifeboat Station was connected by landline to Great Yarmouth Post Office and the Caister to Coast Guard Station. The main aerial mast behind the house was 150 feet high, the aerial wire being suspended between this and a slightly shorter mast situated on nearby land. The large front room of the house contained the main apparatus and was also used as the operating room. The engine for charging the accumulators was situated in a shed adjoining the house and the accumulators themselves were housed in a specially constructed annex. The remainder of the premises were used as a dwelling house for the officer in charge. The range of communication was 150 to 200 miles on the long wave, that's 600 metres wavelength, and 100 miles on the short wave, that's 300 metres wavelength. In 1909, all the Marconi coastal stations were taken over by the post office. In 1911, the Caister station was used to train lightship men in the use of telegraphy equipment. In January 1915, the telegraph equipment on the Cross Sand Lightship was transferred to the Parlour Lightship and the Caister station was changed to general working and not used for ship-to-shore work. Public use of the telegram facility provided at Caister was suspended for the duration of World War I. 
In 1921, plans were made for the reinstallation of wireless on Trinity House lightships, but this time the new wireless telephony was to replace telegraphy, in other words Morse. New technology made the Caister station out of date, and it finally closed in 1929. The masts were taken down, and a few years later the house became the village police station. The club would like to thank local historian Colin Took for these details. Members of the Aroostook County Amateur Radio Emergency Services just got another tool to add to their amateur radio toolbox, training to function as CERT, the acronym for Citizens Emergency Response Team. Brian Goff, KC1NHJ, the Community Outreach Planner for the County's Emergency Management Agency, told WAGM-TV that CERT members provide support to search and rescue personnel, as well as those administering first aid. He went on to say that even if the hams are not directly involved in providing the actual hands-on assistance, their use of radios is invaluable in getting the word out, especially if cell towers are not functioning or overloaded. Their training took place on a Saturday in the middle of April. The CERT members' first big test will come in just a matter of weeks when they will test their new skills by participating in an emergency drill. According to ARRL Eastern Massachusetts Section Emergency Coordinator Rob Macedo, KD1CY, the 2022 Virtual Amateur Radio Workshop from the National Hurricane Conference has been posted on YouTube. We appreciate everyone who attended the workshop live, said Macedo. The attendance was higher than last year, Macedo added. Thanks to all for their continued support of the Amateur Radio Hurricane Program led by WX4NHC, the amateur radio station at the National Hurricane Center, Hurricane WatchNet, VOIP Hurricane Net, Saturn, ARRL, National Hurricane Center, and Canadian Hurricane Center, as well as all the local and regional Skywarn and Canwarn programs in the United States and Canada, and the various local groups that support us internationally. You are invited to watch the workshop video on YouTube. You can also contact Macedo at kd1cy at voipwx.net for additional information about the VOIP Hurricane Net. The online amateur radio community, Mike Zero Oscar Uniform Kilo, have tweeted that their next training course for the UK full license starts soon and places are still available. The online amateur radio community were winners of the prestigious Kenwood Trophy in 2021, and their next full license course will start the week commencing Monday the 3rd of May, with a revision phase of four weeks leading up to the course proper. Membership to the club is free. Course places require a small £5 fee. This will be a nine-week fast-track opportunity for intermediate amateur license holders to prepare for their full license exam. For more information and to sign up, go to oarc.uk forward slash full. This complete course is fully interactive with weekly Zoom sessions, online activities, quizzes, collaborative events, catch-up on demand videos and reference material from a broad selection of sources. In the last six months, the team have had over 170 foundation license holders passing their intermediate exams, all achieving an impressive pass rate. So they're now offering this opportunity to intermediate licensees to move on to the full license. One note of caution, this is an intense course. Most clubs run courses over longer time periods, so be sure to fully read the course overview before applying. The online amateur radio community can be reached at www.oarc.uk and you can find them on Twitter at Mike Zero Oscar Uniform Kilo. In radio sport contesting, four events uh, still good for April 30th. The SBMS 2.3 GHz and Up contest, CW Phone and Digital there. The Russian WW Multi Mode contest, CW Phone and Digital as well. The UK EIDX contest, that's CW only. And the Florida QSO party, CW and Phone. Then for May 1st, the AGCW QRP party, that's CW only. And on May 2nd, the K1USN slow speed test, that's CW, with a maximum of 20 words per minute. And then several ham fest and conventions are on the calendar now. For May 1st, the ARRL Eastern Pennsylvania Section Convention, Warmester Amateur Radio Club and Ham Fest, that's in Bristol, Pennsylvania. 
On May 7th, the ARRL Indiana Convention, North Central Indiana Ham Fest in Peru, Indiana. On May 14th, the ARRL Nebraska State Convention in Lincoln, Nebraska. And on May 20th through the 22nd, Dayton Hamvention in Xenia, Ohio, featuring the ARRL Expo. More than three dozen engineering and science students and their instructors were introduced to amateur radio and all of its elements during a workshop held April 5th and 6th in Gurjat, India. Rajesh Vagadia, VU2EXP Regional Coordinator of AMSAT India, gave the presentation at PDEU, one of the Indian state's top engineering schools. In addition to gaining familiarity with various types of amateur radio equipment and the modes of communications, the students watched practical demonstrations, including Scan TV, PSK31, and Morse code. They also learned how to operate a handy talkie. They were told the stories behind many of the QSL cards on display throughout the two-day program. Some careful planning ahead allowed the students to experience amateur radio contacts using the AO91 CubeSat and had prearranged QSOs with Lucky VU2LBW and Kostov VU2UUU. Rajesh wrote that both four-hour days had a packed schedule, and he hoped the students had gained insights into amateur radio's popularity and possibilities. The popular electromagnetic field event will take place over June the 2nd to the 5th at the East Nor Castle Deer Park, Herefordshire, in the UK. Imagine a camping festival with a power grid and high-speed internet access, a temporary village of geeks, crafters and technology enthusiasts that's lit up by night and buzzing with activity during the day. Thousands of curious people will descend on the friendly open space to learn, share and talk about what they love. EMF Camp will feature a full programme of talks and workshops, and there will be both an amateur radio village with call sign Golf X-Ray 1 Echo Mike Foxtrot and an AMSAT UK village. On their website, the organisers say that over the long weekend, you can expect to see a huge variety of talks across three stages, a slew of workshops, as well as music, games and installations dotted around the site. At previous events, attendees have heard talks about everything from genetic modification to electronics, blacksmithing to high-energy physics, reverse engineering to lockpicking, computer security to crocheting, and quadcopters to brewing. Talks and workshops start at midday on Tuesday the 2nd of June and last until the Sunday evening. Gates open at midday on Thursday, giving you plenty of time to get onto the site and set up your camp. You can stay until midday on Monday, so you can enjoy the festivities on Sunday night. There's a lot more information about the EMF Camp at www.emfcamp.org, and you can also follow them on Twitter at EMF Camp. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Every year, professional and amateur tower climbers fall to their deaths. In most cases, these accidents were avoidable. Not too long ago, people in my community were shocked when a commercial tower climber fell to his death. According to our local paper, Jerry Trammell, 29 years old, not an amateur, of Southern Indiana, fell from an older style microwave reflector tower where he was working with another climber. They were painting the tower. There is no way to prevent all accidents. That's why they call them accidents. As a tower climber, we can reduce them by following some simple safety guidelines. No matter if you're climbing up or down, a simple climbing procedure can dramatically reduce the risk of falling. The cost for this added safety is a slower rate of climb. First off, use the proper commercial climbing belt and attachment gear. Secondly, always wear a commercial climbing shoulder harness. Join the harness to your belt. And lastly, use a similar strap from your harness and attach it to the tower, but always to a different placement on the tower from your belt. This way, no matter which one fails, the other one is more than strong enough to hold your weight and that of your gear and cargo. With a dual strap attachment, you can climb up or down with two straps and always be attached to the tower. Using this method, the only thing that can injure you is a total failure of the tower or a near direct lightning strike. This may slow your vertical movement, but ask yourself this question. If I misplace a clamp, can I flap my arms fast enough to slow my fall to a safe speed? Let's review this simple procedure one more time. You will use two climbing straps to attach to the tower. 
always clamp these two straps to different places on the tower, never to the same tower part. From a standstill, unhook one strap and step up one or two rungs until the other strap is around your knees. Then clamp the first strap as high as you can reach. Now, reach down and unhook the lower strap. Step up until the now higher strap is about knee height and reach up and clamp on with the loose one. By using shoulder harness and waist belts and using this method, you will always be connected to the tower while climbing. Remember to follow the dual attachment safety rule while clamped onto the tower when you intend to let go of the tower and lean fully into your belt. Always clamp onto two different places. When using duplicate strap attachments, you effectively reduce the chances of a fatal fall by nearly half. That's a cheap and cost-effective insurance policy you can write for yourself. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week. For nearly 60 years, the Stewart family in Wisconsin has had more in common than their last name. They seem to have amateur radio in their DNA. It all started with Orville Stewart, WN9IOP, KA9ONQ, SK. He worked in advertising for a local brewing company, and it was his supervisor, an amateur radio operator, who first suggested that he get licensed. Orville asked his son, Walter Bud Stewart, to come along to classes at the old Allied Radio Company and both passed the exam. Orville operated phone and AM and started the Southeast Wisconsin Information Net on two meters, the first in Wisconsin. He went on to become treasurer of the Milwaukee Radio Amateurs Club Incorporated, W9RH, which was founded in 1917 and is one of the oldest amateur radio clubs in the world. Orville became a silent key in 1999 after spending almost 30 years as a ham. But the story doesn't end there. Bud, N0KBS, formerly WN9INY, is now celebrating 58 years as a ham, thanks to his father's interest in the hobby. Bud's son Dustin, KI4ZER, also joined the family legacy, and his son, Tyler, is just waiting for his call sign to get posted by the FCC so he can get on the air. It seems that Tyler, without any prodding from his father or grandfather, became interested in amateur radio at his college radio club at the University of Central Florida. The Stewart family story is just one of the many remarkable stories that amateur radio generates. Bud says it's not just the radio that he enjoys, it's the friends you make and keep for decades, and the legacy you leave behind. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on-air and podcast, Please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copy sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI on 146.940 MHz. 
serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's capital region from Mount Refinesque in Brunswick, New York. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR.